Good morning. I'm Kurt Stewart, one of the elders at the church. I want to thank you for joining us today and uh, joining us for our service. We're on the series called The Path, and uh, it's, the title today is Look Where You're Going. And if you have not already done so, please download the sermon notes and prayer requests. Um, another thing I want to mention is there is a letter that went out yesterday to the congregation, and hope you've received that. If you haven't, check your uh, email. Uh, and if you not, it's not there or you haven't received it, please let us know. Let us know as soon as possible so we can get that information to you. Uh, enjoy this sermon. Can't wait to see you in person.
Well, good morning, and thank you for joining me for this digital service at Grace Evangelical Church. How many of you like to go on hikes? Now, I understand that not everyone likes to get out and enjoy nature, but I actually love hikes. I'd even like to do more hiking if I could just find the time. Just last July, Renee and I went to California, and we visited Sequoia, Kings Canyon, and Yosemite National Parks. And we did a lot of hiking. We saw some amazing sights of God's creation. It was my kind of vacation, if you know what I mean. Have I ever told you how great a wife I have? I think you know that I have a great wife. One day, we checked off one of my bucket list items. We hiked to the top of the upper Yosemite Falls. Well, actually, I hiked to the top of the falls while Renee waited for me about two-thirds of the way to the top. This was the picture that Renee was able to enjoy while she waited on me as I went to the top. Pretty beautiful, isn't it? Here's, a, here's the hike as it's described in Yosemite's official website. Okay? Distance, 7.2 miles round trip. Elevation, 2,700 feet gain. Difficulty, strenuous time, six to eight hours round trip. An adventurous hike, to say the least. Here's another picture just to give you an idea of the distance that one would travel to the top of the falls. It is quite the trip. Listen how the National Park describes this hike on their website. Yosemite Falls Trail leads to the top of the North America's tallest waterfall, which rises 2,425 feet above the valley floor. This trail starts near Camp 4, along the Valley Loop Trail, and immediately begins its climb. Switchback after switchback through Oak Woodland, you'll, you'll climb, or you'll begin to climb, above some trees into the exposed plateaus that offer you a glimpse of what is to come. Great views of Yosemite Valley and its many iconic landforms. Here's the important part that I want you to hear. Do not stray off the maintained path, as you will find steep drops adjacent to the trail. Can you imagine? I want you to see what the well-maintained path looks like because it was not well-maintained in my book. Can you imagine this? This is actually Renee right there. You'll see that what they say, do not stray off the path by this picture. Go ahead. One of the things that I've learned about hiking is you have to always look where you're going, not just for your next step, but your next 20 steps and even further. And that is the title of today's message. You have to look where you're going. And in this series called The Path, we've been learning wisdom from, for our daily lives and for our future from the book of Proverbs. Now, this book, the book that, that we're referring to as Proverbs, mentions that we're on a path or pass almost 30 times. Here are just a few examples of what the Bible talks about. 1.15 says, uh, and it, Solomon warns us there about buddying up with the people with questionable morals. He says this, My son, do not walk in the ways of them. Hold back your foot from their paths. 2.9. In 2.9, Solomon talks about following the way of wisdom. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equality every good path. A few weeks ago, we studied this passage, 3.6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, that is God, and he will make straight your paths. In 4.26, he added a little nuance or supplemental principle to the principle that we've been learning so far. He said this, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. If you've been uh, with us for some, or if not all, of this series, you know that we've been learning some of the principles that are not just true in geography, they are also equally true in life. Today, I want to share three life principles with us, 
and then ask two important questions. The first principle is this, the principle of the path. We've already learned this, but it's a review. Your direction determines your destination. Your direction determines your destination. This morning, I want to add Solomon's qualifier to this principle because I think he might add just a slight modification to what we've learned so far. What gets your attention determines your destination and ultimately our destination. So, principle number two is this, the principle of focus. Or the short version of this principle is this. Your attention determines your direction. It was not that long ago that almost every state in our nation passed laws that prohibited people from talking on their cell phones without some sort of hand-free device. Why do you think they needed to pass those laws? Well, it was obvious because they knew that if a person was staring at their cell phone and giving more attention to it rather than to the road, it was extremely likely that they would steer themselves off the road or maybe steer themselves into somebody else's direction or path. So even our government understands this principle. What you give your attention to will determine your direction. And your direction will determine your destination. Hopefully, not the wrong de destination. Mankind should have known this principle for thousands of years because Solomon taught uh, this principle 3,000 years ago in the book of Proverbs. Here's his whole statement on attention. Listen to what he said. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Proverbs 4, 25-27. In other words, Solomon would say, your destination is determined by your direction. And our direction is dictated by whatever holds our attention. Now, these things that capture your attention will influence your direction. So that's what I want to share with you right now. Let me share two personal examples of how focused attention influences direction and ultimately your destination. So for me, I can focus my attention on projects like only my kids and my wife can attest to. I can start a project, whether it's fixing a car or some project uh, on a mechanical thing, or a home improvement in pro uh, project, and I can keep working on that project until it's finished. Sometimes that means I'll work right through meals and even all night uh, if I have to, even if there's other things that I actually should be doing. Here's another example. Seven years ago, I decided it was time for me to finally finish my master's degree. And I discovered that I needed 36 graduate credits to finish this. I figured out that if I could take four classes at the, at the same time for the spring, summer, and fall semesters, I could finish this in one year. So that's what I focused on. And I did it with, a, with earning a 3.9 GPA. It's amazing what you can do if you focus your attention hard enough to accomplish a goal. But, you know, those are positive examples. I could have just as easily given you examples of the negative side if I wanted to. But we all could, right? Every principle, uh, in, 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 like every principle, the principle of attention can work for us or it can work against us. And I guess if you think about your own life for even a minute, you'll probably be able to come up with your own half a dozen of examples where your attention either helped you complete a goal or the lack of it got you diverted into ways that you wish it never had. Am I right? In his book, Andy Stanley writes these words about the negative side of attention. And he says this, All of us have people or events or opportunities in our past that reflect the much more frequent flip side of attention. Looking back, there are people you wish you had never met, relationships that you wish 
you never initiated, numbers that you wished that you'd never called, voicemails that you wished you never acknowledged, business opportunities you wished you had ignored. Life, has, life was better before these things grabbed your attention. In many cases, the path that you were on before they came along was the path that you should have adhered to, but you didn't. And what grabbed your attention actually altered your direction. So in other words, what captures your attention influences our direction. In other words, attention, direction, destination. That's the principle of the path in three simple words. As your attention goes, so goes your life. Or as Solomon said it, as we read before, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left, but turn your foot away from evil. That is what we want to focus on today. So far, I've placed one verb in front of attention. The first, the first one was positive, something that captures your attention. Now, let me, <clears throat> let me put a second verb in front of attention. This one is a negative, something that grabs your attention. Let me illustrate this grabs your attention uh, piece of, of, of advice by telling you about Taser. My daughter and son-in-law have a little dog that is a puggle. Now, if you don't know what a puggle is, a puggle is a cross between a beagle and a pug. Taser is a great little dog. He's great. He just loves to eat, though. And I think he's really a cross between a beagle and a pig because his attention seems to be genetically locked on the food. When it comes to food, I don't think Taser really has a choice. It seems that he, can, he can't help himself. He gets locked on to any food-related scent, and he is locked on to it. This, is, this has sent him in some not-so-pleasant directions and destinations. For example, if you're a dog person, you probably have heard that chocolate and caffeine will actually kill your dog. Now, I can assure you that this is not always true. Taser is proof of that, that a dog can eat chocolate and actually live to eat another day. But unlike our friends in the animal kingdom, we do have a choice. You and I don't have to be ruled by the things that capture our attention or grab our attention. Which brings me to the third principle today. It is the principle of choice. You and I actually have the opportunity to make a choice. You and I get to choose what we give our attention to. That's what makes all of this thing so interesting. God allows us to choose so very often. Which leads me to two other verbs that I want to give to you about this principle. Besides capture attention and give attention, number one, you can choose to give your attention. You can choose. And number two, you can choose to pay attention. Here's the key. The first one is this. Our emotions tend to fuel the things that capture or grab our attention. That's our emotions. But the second one is this. Our intentionality tends to fuel what we give or pay attention to. We have a choice. On every path that leads us uh, to a disaster or to destruction, there is something very powerful and emotional that is entangling us and summons us, that captures or grabs our attention. Which is why Solomon warned, warned us over and over again, warned us by saying this, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your feet away from evil. That is the verse that we keep coming back to today. So we need to make a choice. We need to choose which direction we will go. And then we need to fix our gaze directly on that path. 
What will you give your attention to determines your direction, and the direction we head determines your destination. So here are the two important questions that I want to leave with, leave with us, each of us, today. Two important questions. Number one, I want to ask you the question that you need to answer honestly. What has your attention these days? What has your attention? Is it a relationship? Is it a career? A house? A hobby? Is it a person who is leading you somewhere you really don't want to go? Or is it a person who is actually leading you in the direction that you do want to go? Those are important things. Is it a marriage? Is it your children? Is it your faith? Is it an achievement that you're really hoping to accomplish and accomplish very soon? What has your attention these days? Honestly, answer that question. Secondly, what captures your attention or what have you chosen to give your attention to will determine your, des your direction and your direction will determine your destination. We have to remember those things. Number two is this. Here's the second question. What do you want to give your attention to? If you could only fix your eyes on one thing what would that one thing be? Now, we've been in this series for five weeks so far, and I want to, I want to make a, a suggestion to you. Listen to the, how the Apostle Paul describes his approach to life. He said these words, Brothers, I do not consider what I have, what ha, what I, uh, have made it my own, that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That is Paul's motto. That is Paul's mantra for life. He followed those verses up by saying this, let those of us who are mature think this way, which means that it can be for all of us. Almost every book in the Bible that describes the focus life does so in this very same way, just as Paul did. Let me give you an example. The author of the book of Hebrews wrote these words. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Do you hear the similarities between Paul and the writer of Hebrews? Some of you watching today may have allowed your faith in Jesus to maybe drift for a while. Maybe you're drifting right now. And you may be wondering, how did this happen? Well, I can tell you, it happens because of the principle of attention. Our eyes or our attention, our thoughts, followed something other than the Lord, and we drifted away from God. It's the principle that we've been learning about in this entire series. So this same author of Hebrews said these words. Here's what we need to do to stay on the right path spiritually. And he says this, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. That is the model that is set before us with our Lord Jesus. I want us to consider the verb looking to Jesus. Actually, that word means to look intently at or to not allow your eyes to wander. This is my suggestion for all of us today. Don't let your hearts or your attention be captured by lesser things to focus our attention only on Jesus, to follow only him, getting to know him better, to serve him more fully, because we need to become more like him every day. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote his centerpiece to the Christians at Philippi when he described all of this so very well and all this thing about path, that he wanted us to have the same attitude that Jesus had. And he wrote these words. Have this mind among yourself, 
which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in the hu- in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him, highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Here's the key. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What an amazing passage. It is the centerpiece of the whole book of Philippians. Remember, a few weeks ago, when we learned that the prudent person, the prudent see danger, and they take refuge. But the simple, the simple person, keeps right on going and ends up paying the penalty. Here's the danger, and I hope that you see, that you see during this message. If if you pursue anything less than Jesus, you may end up bowing your knee before him from a destination that you never wanted to arrive at. And I believe this is why in Hebrews chapter 12 too, it says these words. Looking to Jesus, he is the path to heaven, by the way, the path of fulfillment, the purpose of the path uh, to where you really want to be. Here's the, way Je- here, here's the way that Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, the way is the path, right? Jesus says, I am the way. He is the path that we are to follow. And he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow my example. That's what we need to do. Because whatever you give your attention to will will determine your direction, and whatever direction you head will determine where you wind up. You and I have a choice that we can make. We have several choices in life. You and I can follow Jesus. We can choose to do that. Or we can follow something far less. We can let our attention be grabbed by something that feels good for the moment, but not in the long term. Or we can give our attention to the one who will direct us all the days of our lives and eventually on into eternity. So let me see if I can conclude this message with a few wrap-ups. Which choice are you going to make today? Are you going to choose something less or are you going to choose Jesus? Some of you may have chosen never to follow Jesus before. Maybe you like to choose him today, though, maybe for the first time. In just a minute, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that could change your eternity, and it could change your now as well, because I think it'll change your path that you're on right now spiritually. I hope that you'll pray this prayer with me in just a little bit. Now let me speak to some of you others. Some of you may have decided to follow Jesus a long time ago, and for some reason you've let your attention be grabbed or captured by something or someone far less. Today, is the day to correct all that. Don't don't you think it is? Today is the day to say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I no longer want to serve other gods or other things. Now, if you've never trusted Jesus before, why not pray a prayer something like this? It goes very simple. Jesus, I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and I want to choose to follow you today. I admit that I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me. I ask for your forgiveness and I want you, I want to let you be in charge of my life. I hope you'll pray that prayer or something like that very, very soon. Now, if you've trusted Jesus before, but you've stopped following him for some reason, why not pray a prayer or something like this? Jesus, I know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, but I haven't been walking in your path recently. Today, I am choosing to put you first again in my life. And I choose today to fix my eyes on you and to follow you. Help me to walk in your path once again. Well, let me give you some next steps. Come back next week, and we're going to have, hopefully, a service right here in this building. And if we do, it will be be a wonderful thing. 
next week is Father's Day, and I'll have a special Father's Day message for all us dads and for everyone else to kind of join in on. Then in two weeks, I want you to come back, and we're going to wrap up this series, the final installment, with one important, one important message. And I want to talk about what do we do when we realize that we're on a, a road that says road closed, and we see that sign. What were we going to do when we can't reach our destination that we were hoping to reach? Maybe in marital or material, financial or physical or some other way, we see that road closed sign. Number two, I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. When you and I get caught up each day, each week, we need to stop and just focus on him. Spend some time alone with him every day. Maybe read the book of Proverbs or even one proverb every day. Pray for a friend that is not on the Jesus path. Maybe you know someone that is a good person, but they've never followed Jesus. They've never met Jesus. They don't understand Jesus. Why not begin praying for them today? Why don't you join me in prayer right now? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you've allowed us to gather to look to your word and gain the wisdom from the book of Proverbs, once again, by the wise King Solomon, who wrote to us, words that will encourage us to live for you today and every day of our life. And I pray for each one that's listening to me today that as you've given uh, me the opportunity to plan and to study for this message, that these have not just been human words, but you've empowered these words by your Holy Spirit to change our lives. I pray that you apply them as only you can, that we will begin not only to see that our path can be a better path for you, but we can invite others that are not on this path to join us. Because, Lord, on this path, on your path, there's always room for one more person. Lord, we know that that's the way you want to work. So may you do a mighty work in us, in our church, and in our community as we stay on your path, on the Jesus path. In his name I pray, amen. Well, thank you for joining me today, and as we've worshipped the Lord, as we've looked to God's Word, I pray that this message has been impactful to you. I've shared with you in the sermon notes some so what questions, and I ask that you go through those questions with those that you're with right now, that you'll take this, these so what questions to go from a passive listening to an active learning or an active doing, that you'll take these words and you'll be able to apply them to your heart. That's why I give you those so what questions. Spend some time going through those with those that you're with right now. And if you don't have somebody that you're with right now, you're listening by yourself, why not share those questions with a friend or someone that you can share this message with, and then the two of you can get together and talk through these so what questions. Maybe you listen today, and for the very first time, you prayed that prayer of trusting Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe you've gotten off the Jesus path, and now you want to get back on it. Please let me know. That would be a great encouragement to me. Either of those ways, or however this message has influenced your life, and you can send those uh, comments or those questions to me at timgeclgen at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Don't forget, we have a good, good God who loves us, who is wise, and he wants us to follow him. He wants us to stay on that Jesus path. Please do so. God bless you.